Greetings and welcome to this inaugural edition of Berkeley Conversations COVID-19. I'm Dan Mogula from UC Berkeley's Office of Communications and Public Affairs. Starting today, we will be streaming and posting a wide range of online events featuring members of our faculty, all of them leading experts in their fields, so they can share what they know and what they are learning. Today, we'll be talking about how we can make sense of the massive amount of epidemiological data we are being hit with every day and what that tells us about the present and the future. I'm pleased to welcome Associate Provost Jennifer Chase, who leads our Division of Computing, Data Science and Society and Berkeley School of Information. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her research areas include biomedicine applications and epidemiological modeling. I'm also very pleased to welcome Professor Art Rheingold, MD, the Division Head of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Berkeley School of Public Health. He has more than 40 years of experience in uh, prevention and control of infectious diseases at the national and global level. Jennifer, I wanna start with you and Art, I'm gonna ask you to weigh in on the same question. There's a phenomenon a lot of people have noticed. It seems like we're just being deluged by information on a daily basis. The amount is stunning. Data, graphs, curves, exponential growth, per capita numbers, you name it. But it seems like the more information we're getting, the less certainty and clarity there is. So Jennifer, you're a data maven, you're an expert. How are you navigating right now? Where are you going? And how are you weighing what you see to, to try to get the clarity that so many people lack? First, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate being a part of this and getting to speak to our Berkeley community and beyond. Uh, you know, as, as you say, the data is all over the place and even more than the data being all over the place, the conclusions drawn from the data are all over the place. Uh, we are collecting data very differently in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. And so much of what we see is as much a function of how the data is being collected as of what it truly represents. I would say the most reliable numbers are things like deaths, un unfortunately, because uh, those tend to be reported more accurately and reflect a little more of what's going on. But uh, you know, right now I am watching and waiting and seeing, and we as a community are trying to do everything we can to help us understand this and weather it and get beyond it. Before I go to Art, I, I just wonder if you think as, again, somebody who's involved in data science education, if we're paying a little, a little bit of a price right now as a society, as a democracy, as a country, for sort of a lack of numeracy, for a lack for the unfamiliarity many of us have with large data sets? I do think that uh, it's very important and it has been important pre-COVID-19 uh, to be more comfortable with data because so much of what we hear in the news is actually inferences that are presumably drawn from data. And you know, we we all should be much more um, much more comfortable with data, so that we can decide for ourselves which information to take very seriously, which to take less so, and how to question the sources of the information we're getting. Yeah. So, Art, let me come to you on that. Um... How are you navigating and what are you seeing in the data today, Friday? What story is being told right now? So first, again, I'd like to thank you for including me in this. Uh, I, I guess I would start by saying that back in early February, I gave an update on, on this epidemic um, for the School of Public Health and its community. And most of what I said then is no longer correct, or at least there's been enormous progress in our understanding of what is basically a completely new disease. So I think one of the challenges we all confront uh, is keeping up to date with something where literally new facts, new recommendations emerge on a daily basis. Um, so um, just in terms of advice I would give people, 
I think, um, in the old days. Uh, if you wanted to be up to date about a scientific or medical problem, you could go to the medical journals or the scientific journals if you had access to them in a library, but most people didn't have that access. Today, of course, everything is on the web. Everything is available electronically, um, and, and that's good and bad. Uh, because we have reliable websites uh, providing data updated every day from the World Health Organization, from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and from really good news outlets like the New York Times. So uh, I think the New York Times actually is doing a phenomenal job of updating data and presenting the data in what are generally a very understandable set of graphs and figures and, 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 and tables. And anyone can access that, even if you're not a subscriber, because they're making all of that available for free. So, so um, I would advise people that th these are really good sources. Uh, clearly, the, this pandemic is now reaching more and more people, causing more and more deaths. Uh, there are hot spots, if you will, in New York City. Um, there are other places where the rate of increase is even higher than in New York City, but the total numbers ill and, and dying or, or not at that level. So it's a really rapidly evolving uh, pandemic and our knowledge and the recommendations we make to keep oneself safe are also literally changing by the week. Speaking of the New York Times in the paper today, and if people haven't seen it, I, I would urge them to take a look. It shows um, across the country, different states, different metropolitan areas, how the disease is progressing, the expansion of new cases, of mortality figures and all the rest. And it's widely divergent. California to a lay person, looks like the California curve is flattening. Looks like the New York curve so shows no signs of slowing down. But what do you see? What story is being told right now by the data sets as of today, Friday morning? Well, I would agree with what you said. I think in part because of early action on the part of uh, some counties in California and then by the governor, we may be seeing a, a quote flattening of the curve sooner than other communities in the United States. Um, but, but I would say that what's really apparent, at least in the U.S. context, is quite a, a, a diverse set of circumstances. So some communities are literally about to experience rapid rates of increase. Others may be seeing a flattening of the curve. We don't really have one national epidemic. Uh, we have uh, localized uh, situations and, and these graphs and curves and numbers uh, can be one helpful indicator of where things are getting worse and are likely to get worse in the coming weeks and where with any luck things will be getting better. In the coming weeks. I'm gonna come back to you in just a second because I wanna talk about social distancing and masks, but I, let's turn back to Jennifer for a second because something Art said, you know, sparked another idea or question that I have. And that's the danger and the threat of mis or disinformation at the moment. So you also um, are the lead for our school of information. What are you seeing? Talk to us a little bit about this threat of misinformation because Art mentioned the internet. And you know, I remember when the internet first rolled out in the 90s that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, mm -hmm. but also not everybody knows whether you're credible. Talk to us a little bit about that phenomenon, Jennifer. So we have people in the School of Information and the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department who study misinformation, especially in social media. Uh, they are, so some of them are working with social media companies right now uh, to the credit of these companies, to the great credit of these companies, to try to identify and pull off misinformation that is going out. Some of it, I mean, some of it is intentional to create certain effects, to create certain opportunities to sell things and other, other agendas. And then there is also just um, a lot of unintentional misinformation, people who are, you know, armchair experts who are getting out there and interpreting the data in various ways. Those are the ones that are almost more, uh, more insidious because they know a little bit, they can sound good, uh, they may even have some academic credentials, just not in the areas of relevance. They're not epidemiologists like art. 
their experts in some other area. So I would say be very careful about what you read. Go to really reliable sources. Some of those sources are public sources. As Art said, the New York Times is a very good source. And so uh, just as always, actually, really be careful about sources of information on the internet. Thank you. So uh, speaking of experts, Art, let me come back to you. Um, talk about mass for a second. You know, the repository of expertise, the CDC seems to have pulled something like a 180 degree turn on, in terms of wearing masks. Talk to us a little bit about that, whether you think you, whether you believe that they made the right move um, and the role that masks can and should play as we move forward. So this I'm sure is a very confusing area for people um, as, as pronouncements uh, have changed uh, over the past several months. Uh, I, I do think one consistent message, which is still true, is we want to uh, give priority for masks to our healthcare providers, uh, people who are greatly exposed in the hospital or healthcare setting. And because for some reason we have a shortage uh, of masks, particularly what are called N95 masks, we absolutely want to conserve those until they're available in greater numbers for healthcare providers. Now, having said that, <clears throat> We also have made, and I think these recommendations are also still true, uh, a recommendation that people who uh, are coughing and sneezing, if they must go out, we want them to wear a mask to prevent them from or reduce the risk that they will transmit to others. <coughs> but what I think is new and what is confusing is that we have generally said in the past that healthy people going about their business didn't need to wear a mask. Um, they should practice social distancing, they should wash their hands, uh, they should do other things like that, but they didn't need to wear a mask to be out and about, unlike in some Asian cultures, for example, where everyone is wearing a mask. And that recommendation has changed literally within the last few days uh, because of a recognition that this virus uh, potentially is being spread by people who have no symptoms, they either will never have symptoms or they're, they don't have symptoms yet. And they're not coughing and sneezing, but they may be able to expel the virus during normal talking and breathing. And so the primary reason people are suggesting that healthy people wear masks when they have to do their shopping or go to the pharmacy is to reduce the possibility that a, a, an asymptomatic infected person uh, will put out virus into the air and, and uh, infect someone else. Um, so that's been the primary update, if you will, in terms of our thinking about why covering your face if you're gonna go out is a good idea. But I should emphasize, it's not intended to replace social distancing. Mm. It's intended to augment social distancing. What else do you think? Are there other things we're not doing either on a regional level, a national level, or a global level that if you had your way, we would all be doing right now that would become a matter of public policy? Well, if you mean we in the um, uh, public health community, um, I, I would say there are a number of things we're not doing well in the United States and they relate to shortages in the, in, in the public health infrastructure of personnel of materials, uh, so we still don't have adequate access to testing uh, for this virus uh, around the United States. We have uh, the result of years of underfunding of public health agencies, so we don't have enough people to run around and do follow-up and contact tracing and things like that. So I, I wish we could be doing a much better job of, of those really basic, somewhat mundane activities. I think in terms of individuals, I think we, we, we have, have some remarkable evidence of people uh, reducing their interpersonal exposures and staying home, but that's much easier for a Berkeley professor to do than it is for many, many people in the community who simply cannot stay home. But unfortunately, we also have people who aren't taking this seriously and still are going out and, and, and it, uh, congregating in groups. We have political leaders who are not yet convinced of the need to, for social distancing. So we have a very uneven application of that very important uh, prevention effort. 
So Jennifer, I'm going to turn back to you and sort of again in the data area, because one of the things we're seeing a lot in the press is this idea of different models um, and different assumptions and different variables. What does that all mean when they talk about different models? And how do we know which model to look at? How do people making decisions know which model to look at? Well, I think it's not clear that we know which model to look at. We have lots of different kinds of models. The models change as we learn more. So as Art was saying, we now realize that people can be shedding the virus when they're asymptomatic. So then in your model, you have to have, you have to be following a variable, right? You have to have a variable in there for, um, you know, who, who is shedding the virus when they are not showing any symptoms. And so the models themselves change and also the fitting of the parameters of the model. So, you know, we hear a little bit about this R not parameter, which is how many people on average does someone who is infected mm. uh, transmit the virus to. And um, Obviously, it's very different if you're practicing social distancing or you're not practicing social distancing. But as we try to fit these models, we're looking at very different means of data collection. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is very messy data. It's being collected very differently in different parts of the country. None of us are testing enough, but some areas are testing much more than other areas. And so that makes it look as if the disease is having a very different progression when it actually is not having such a different progression. There are things that do affect it like social distancing, density of population, but testing is a huge piece of that. So I think it is true that we don't know the right models. The models evolve as our understanding of the disease changes, but also just fitting the parameters with this very messy, incomplete data is difficult. We have people at Berkeley and indeed people throughout the world trying to check these parameters and these models. Got it, thank so, you. Um, Art, right, I'm gonna come back to you with, with probably maybe the question that's forefront for really for everybody. When will this be over and how do you see it Ending. What will that look like? And at your best estimate as an epidemiologist of where we are on that timeline. So how, when, and can you speed it up a little bit, please? <laughs> so, so first of all, I think an honest answer is no one knows with any certainty. Uh, the second thing we can say, however, with certainty is that we're not going to have a vaccine to get us out of this pickle uh, okay. for the next year and, and quite possibly longer than that. So. Um, those are some harsh realities. Uh, so what we try and do is look at the current information that we have and, and make parallels uh, to other viruses. Uh, some people make parallels to influenza. Some mm. people make parallels to other coronaviruses that cause milder infections. Unfortunately, all of that doesn't take you in a, in a consistent direction. So one unanswered question is, will, will warmer weather uh, result in reduced transmission the way it does for influenza. Well, it might or it might not. Uh, if the virus does go away during the summer the way flu virus does, it's very, very likely, I would say almost certain, that it will return next winter because most of the population will still be susceptible and the virus will not have disappeared from the planet. So we have to be prepared uh, for a possible resurgence next winter. So, so I would hope that the, all the social distancing we're, we're doing and the other things we're trying to do, uh, we will see a sharp decline during the summer for some combination of reasons. I think it's very likely we'll see a resurgence again next fall and winter. Um, but at least we will have better tools available then for, I hope, uh, testing people, uh, antibody tests to see who might be immune, uh, guiding people so that they can be safely back at work um, and, and doing better contact tracing, isolation, quarantine, because we have more staff and we have more availability of tests. So I'm hoping we will have better tools available 
if we do have a resurgence next fall. All right, so I'm Governor Newsom or I'm Governor Cuomo or any governor in the United States and mm -hmm. I call you up and I say, Art, I, I really, when can I, when can I lift these shelter in place orders? When will we know that it's safe, that it's reasonable to return to something that begins to look like normal life? What do you advise? What would you advise that governor? Well, I think we, the honest advice is beyond the models, which are certainly very informative when the right parameters are put into them. I, I think we need to follow closely these curves that you see uh, in the newspaper. Um, uh, probably the most reliable curves are the ones relating to deaths uh, and to hospitalizations. So let me interrupt you for a sec. So you, in other words, you would want to see before you told the governor that we can begin to get back to normal, you would want to see the increase or the new cases of deaths begin to flatten, reduce? What would you want to see? I think we'd want to be substantially beyond that. Not only the, the increase flatten, but we'd like to see sharp declines in the overall numbers of deaths and hospitalizations, which reflect infections that occurred several weeks earlier. Uh, so we'd like to see evidence that transmission is declining in the community um, and that will, this is a lagging indicator, but it's a fairly good indicator that transmission is declining because of our efforts to reduce transmission um, and, and that there are fewer and fewer transmissions occurring. Got it. So I'm going to pose the next question to both of you. And Jennifer, I'll start with you. You're, again, a data maven. So when did you start to become concerned when, as you were looking, like all of us were at data, and the initial data came out of China, what were, when did alarms start to go off for you? I think, um, you know, uh, one really worries about exponential growth, as we've uh, been, been hearing. And uh, one of the things you look for is something exceeding anything you've ever seen before. That is one of the, the indicators, okay? Uh, we were lucky, we controlled SARS, we controlled some of the others. Controlled, of course, there were casualties, but much more modest and it didn't seem to take off in, in the few communities that really had it as much as it is taking off now in New York City and in Northern Italy. So when I began to see it pass SARS and some of the others, I began to get really concerned. When I heard estimates of the number of people who got it from a given person, though those were crude estimates, I began to get concerned. So that was maybe, you know, I, I started trying to social distance um, a couple because I have asthma, so I have to be careful. Uh, I tried to social distance myself maybe a, a few weeks before uh, we had the shelter in place order in the Bay Area, which was of course very early rest relative to the rest of the country. Thanks. Art, were you taken by surprise? Did you did your red flags go up early? When when did you start to say, uh oh? Well, as I said, we, we actually gave a session on this in early February in the School of Public Health. And um, initially, when I said I proposed this, I was told, well, let's do this in a few weeks. And I said, you know, I think actually we should do this sooner rather than later, because um, I think it's only going to get worse. Um, so I was at least smart enough to figure that out based on my experience. But I would also say I really misjudged uh, the, what, how this would eventually unfold, particularly in the United States. And I have to admit, I was unduly optimistic, uh, at, perhaps back in February, uh, that with good uh, public health interventions, uh, uh, that we would really get a handle on this and not experience uh, what, what uh, China had experienced and what we're now seeing in New York. So I misjudged the situation uh, then, uh, in part because I think this virus is in some ways uh, uniquely different from the other viruses we're talking about. Um, and, and in part because I think uh, the United States really dropped the ball uh, in a number of ways, and we really did not respond appropriately in, in, in a timely fashion. Let me ask you really quickly, because we're we've only got a few minutes left. How is this virus different now that you brought that up? 
Well, I think, uh, you know, Jennifer was referring to in influenza, this virus, uh, the r naught, if you will, there is, is higher for this virus than Meaning it is. Meaning the, the, the extent to which one, can, one person can affect many? It's more infectious, right? right. Um, secondly, uh, influenza, because we're always getting exposed to flu viruses all the time. We all have some immunity to lots of different flu viruses. Um, nobody has immunity to this new coronavirus. Zero percent of the population started out immune to this, which creates more of a, a tinder in which the, the conflagration can, can unfold. Um, it appears to be transmitted through a number of routes that I think many of us didn't really think were very likely through aerosols or perhaps through surfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, we mostly assumed it was large droplets, coughing and sneezing large droplets, uh, but it's now clear that it's being transmitted in other ways as well. So, so I think there are some ways in which um, this virus, the illness may look similar to people, a flu-like illness, if you will, but there are some ways in which it really is different. Okay. Last question, Jennifer, and then uh, we're gonna need to wrap up. Um, interestingly enough, data science, the division you head, is sort of one of the key hubs on the Berkeley campus for research, an indication of the extent to which data is playing a role in so many different disciplines, not just in terms of the virus, but just in general in academia these days. Can you very briefly give us a sense of what researchers at Berkeley are working on right now as they are turning their attention and bringing their resources to bear on this unprecedented crisis? So there are a few things. There's trying, we've, we've got wonderful statisticians working on trying to fit these models. If we get that right, we can do a lot better on our predictions. We have some people looking at um, contact tracing, which may be a means of unwinding this shelter in place. Uh, in the Institute for Integrative Genomics here, um, they have come up with a test that scales very well. So what if what do you do if you can really test people? Then you might start to let people out into the community a little more, but you have to be able to pull them back. So I have a phone here. This phone can tell me where I've been and whom I've been near. Uh, it's kind of scary from a privacy point of view. So we have people working on privacy protecting ways of doing contact tracing. We have people building platforms for contact tracing. We have others deciding where to get ventilators to. So we have a lot of people figuring out how to deal with the crisis and maybe how to help us unwind the crisis with testing, contact tracing, and quarantining. And what I wanna say is that the Berkeley community has really, really stepped up. Everybody is trying to bring their expertise to bear to help us all emerge from this. And Art, last question for you. What are you studying? What are you learning right now from all this happening? So we, we are busy doing studies uh, in the community, in my partnerships with people in the county and state health department. Uh, departments, uh, looking at uh, doing a much better job of understanding the cases that are occurring um, at the clinical end as well as at the epidemiologic end. Uh, we're trying to use systems for studying influenza and pneumonia in general uh, to better understand the burden of, of coronavirus disease. So we're piggybacking on to existing studies uh, that are out there uh, already going on in the community but I also have colleagues who are developing new epidemiologic studies uh, of coronavirus in the Bay Area and elsewhere. I would also just point to work not in the School of Public Health, but in bioengineering and chemistry and molecular biology, where people are also doing a very innovative work very quickly to come up with better diagnostic tests and, and, and a host of other things. So this really is, is a campus-wide effort. Um, and I, just another example, I had a, a, a proposal today from someone in anthropology who wants help with a study of uh, looking at masking and the cultural acceptance of masking from an anthropologic point of view. So it really is a multidisciplinary uh, approach. Fabulous. Um, I really want to thank both of you for what was a really informative conversation. 
And for all of you who joined us today, next up in this Berkeley conversation series is what promises to be a pretty special event. Next Tuesday, April 7th, from 10 to 11.30 a.m. Pacific time, Nobel laureate Saul Perlmutter, who is the director of the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, and Michael Liu, the dean of our School of Public Health, will be moderating a roundtable discussion focusing on how researchers are mobilizing computing and data science for COVID-19 response and recovery. Everything from helping local health officials track outbreaks to predicting and addressing the impacts on employment in elections. And next Friday, we'll be seeking answers to salient questions about the impact of the crisis on our economic present and future. We'll provide you with updates as new events are scheduled, and you can always visit the Berkeley Conversations website to check the schedule and access events you may have missed. In the meantime, please be well, stay safe, and keep your distance. Thanks for joining us.